So welcome to week two. Um, how's everybody doing? Tired? Did you have a nice weekend? Yeah, that was good. Good, good, good. Um, okay, uh, so Kimmy, this is where you could jump in. So last week we covered the orientation PowerPoint and I sent you the lecture, right, for week one. Um, so that we didn't have to cover week one and week two today. Um, so that's up to you um, to be, you know, reviewing it. I also sent you the study guide for the exam next week. Okay. And I always say, I tell all my students, the study guide is an excellent, excellent representation of what's on the exam. So don't feel like you have to go back to every single chapter and read it from cover to cover. I mean, you please study the important concepts and topics that we, we review over the last two weeks. Um, and then the study guide is kind of your cheat sheet, you know, of what topics and concepts to make sure you understand, okay? Um, I haven't done, I'm gonna try and do my groups tonight. I'm gonna do you guys first because you guys have an assignment due next week with groups. Um, so I'm gonna try and get those out to you tonight or right after my class in the morning. <laughs> I just haven't had a minute to do it. Um, looks like most of you turned in all your work for week one. Great, on time. Um, if you didn't, you heard, if you didn't turn in your initial discussion, discussion post, I sent you an email Thursday morning as I said I would. Um, and then this morning, I don't know if I sent any emails out to this class. So anyway, um, if I didn't, thank you for, if you didn't get an email, thanks for turning in all your work on time. I appreciate it. Um, so do we, let's start with questions. Any questions from last week? Okay, let's go with Kimmy first. Go ahead, Kimmy. Um, it was just a question on the NCLEX questions that were due this week. When I went in and I put in all the like, content area, it only gave me 45 questions, not 50 hmm. to do. So this came up last term for the first time with a couple of students and I had them go back and double check all of the, all of the concepts uh, or all the information to enter and it popped up 50. However, I believe that if you're short a few questions, I believe that those that topic has already been covered by you and you've already done well on the questions. So it didn't provide you any more. I mean, you can uncheck the box and it'll give you questions that you've already done to do the last like four, however many mm -hmm. you to do. Mm -hmm. I did that also I and I refreshed mine, but it still came up with 45 only. Yeah, that's what I did too. Okay. Well, the only thing I can think of is that the five that you're missing are already under concepts that you've already covered in another class maybe, and that you got them all correct and it didn't spit you out those last five. So number one, I would double check to make sure you've entered all the information. And number two, I would suggest you do, try and suggest you try again what Shauna said. And if, if that doesn't, neither of those work, then just submit the 45. Okay. It's when you submit like 25, you can tell it's just half the, half the information. So, okay. So does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? So I was doing the cahoots today that um, you put in the announcements. How close would you say like those are to the exam? Well, I, didn't, I, haven't of, looked, I haven't looked at the study guide yet, but okay. I was doing the cahoots stuff and they yeah, seem I mean, to- Yeah, I mean, the cahoots is a supplement to all of what you're, we're learning in class and, um, in the study guide. So it's just a supple, it's just additional. I mean, I, I don't know how to answer that question. How close is it to the exam? I, I Well, no, because you said that this is pretty, what would, you know, the study guide that you sent out at the beginning, you said that that was um, pretty close to the content that was on the exam. Well, um, actually what I said was uh, on the study guide, the important topics and concepts that we cover are on the study guide. 
but you need to make sure you have a good understanding of the, the information on the study guide. And if you have to go back to your book or your PowerPoints to further research and understand those, those concepts on the study guide, um, the, the CAHOOTS is simply a supporting document. It just reinforces the teaching. Okay. So what I'm saying is don't rely on the study guide. You know, it's a good representation, but please make sure that you have an understanding of, you know, the content. Not, yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, there was a couple of things for mentioning the cahoots. Um, there were a couple in there that are really, really, I mean, there's week one cahoots uh, in the week one group. There's two I wanted to point out to you. One is the cahoots for AdPi, which is excellent. And the other one is the cahoots for um, primary, secondary, and tertiary. So if you watch anything, go in and do those because um, primary, secondary, and tertiary are on every exam. There's several questions on each exam about those three levels. And then ADPI should just be a refresher of the actual nursing process, but ADPI and community cahoots applies your nursing process to the community setting. Does that make sense? So definitely take advantage of those, okay? I don't send them out to give you more work. I send them out so that it reinforces the teaching, okay? The other thing you got from me in the last couple of days is a master review schedule, okay? For exams one, two, and three, and then the HESI, okay? So you, so you can plan out your, plan out your, hopefully attending a live review session or two uh, or however many you can. Um, I would highly encourage you to try and get to a live session. It doesn't have to be mine. Um, I think there's four, four for each uh, session or four for each exam. You will get the recordings of all four of them, but I would suggest that as a plan B. I mean, if you have to reinforce your, your knowledge with, the, some recordings, that's great, but um, I would really encourage you to get to live sessions. It is, it is so, it is pretty evident that if you attend the live session, you actually do better on the exam than listening to recordings. So uh, I, I've say, I say that every term and, you know, the, it, that's the way, it, that's the way it turns out. It really does every single term. So, um, we try to do them not just on the weekends, um, but before the weekend, because we know a lot of people work on the weekends. So I would just say, do your best. Um, I believe all your deans have got a copy of the exam review schedule as well. So they may be encouraging you to, to go as well. Okay, so hopefully it's helpful to receive all that information up front. Um, what else did I send you this week? Oh, today I sent you a bunch of um, math resources, right? I sent you a, a really good link to um, a, like I told you last week I would, to Dean Brown, who did an extensive math tutorial back in November. Um, I sent you the link to that today. And then I sent you two other links of test taking strategies. Did you guys get that? You might have not had a chance to look at it or even see it, but I did send you two emails, additional emails on just resources, test taking strategies, critical thinking, how to answer questions. You may have already seen it before, but I like to send it out at the beginning of the term so that, you know, you just have as many tools in your toolbox to get through this class. Okay. Um, any other questions? As far as the Kahoot is concerned, is that questions that will be, are they questions that will be similar to what is on the exam? Or are they just stuff to reinforce the material? Reinforce, okay. reinforce the material. Yeah, yeah. No, those Kahoots are not on the, the exam. Uh, the topics are, but it's just reinforcing. So, um, yeah. So I hope everybody... Um, 
really just kind of studies for this exam and does well so that you don't fall behind after week three. It's just, it's not worth it. You just work in double time. So, okay. Um, let's, let's get going. Recover, anybody know what we're covering tonight? Let's see. All right, we're covering chapters 18, 19, 20, and 31. Okay, family development and family nursing assessment. And these are all headers on your study guide as well. Okay, uh, so those of you had your study guide, you can follow along as well. Family health risks, family health risks across the lifespan, and um, the nurse in schools. Okay, so I've sent you the PowerPoints. Hopefully you had a chance to review them and hopefully you had a chance to review the objectives. Um, did you guys understand the uh, message I sent about the two student learning activities that are in each chapter? They have, a, there's a student case study and there's a, I think it's called a participation or what is the second, we'll see it in the book, but it says at the bottom of the ex student exercise, they're just additional exercises in the chapters to reinforce learning. Um, it says go to Elsevier to get the answers. Um, I've already, that's what I've sent you is the answer. So you don't have to go looking back at Elsevier. Okay. So let's uh, just real quick review the module for week two. Um, you got your reading. We just went through it. Um, Got your book. Discussion question one, the only thing I will tell you is please read the, please read the directions because you have to pick three of the ailments, child, common childhood ailments, okay? For all three, you have to do signs and symptoms, Okay, well, let's see, choose three above ailments, discuss signs and symptoms for the health condition, right? Or discuss health consequences if you choose teen pregnancy, seatbelt safety, and helmet safety. Okay, so that's one. But remember, each of the three ailments needs its own educational plan, a six point plan that you would use to teach parents. Okay, so don't pick three things and then do one education plan. And each one needs its own. Okay. And again, um, make sure you have your initial posts in by Wednesday night. And then your peer review, peer responses are due on Sunday. Okay. There's your NCLEX, we'll do the live attestation. Let's see what questions we're answering tonight. Define primary, secondary, tertiary, give example of each one. Okay, so we'll be looking for that. Okay, and then for the following week um, is the case study, the Healthy People 2030. It's, you're gonna be, your group's gonna be assigned one of three case studies. You're gonna, group A is gonna have case study one, group B is gonna have case study two. You just need to get together, uh, split it up and turn it in. It's, it's not a hard assignment. It, it's more to expose you to this Healthy People 2030, which is what we're moving towards. We're past Healthy People 2020, okay? And then next week is exam. Oh, so Friday, uh, Saturday morning, I will, Friday night, Saturday morning, I will have the exam ready for you to download. So if you guys are a Monday class, you'll have to make sure it's downloaded by Monday. Right? You guys know that drill. Okay, any questions? So if you've reviewed, the, I, I like to teach a lot from the book because I think it reinforces, obviously the PowerPoints are an outline of the book, of the chapter in the book. And I've gone through the book and highlighted important things from each chapter that we should be pulling out that will help us uh, be able to articulate the objectives. Okay, so uh, just curious, I'm just curious, curious, just 
honestly, how many people have had a chance to review week two material, chapters 18, 19, 20, and 31, at least the PowerPoints? Anybody? I looked at the PowerPoints, not for the last chapter. Okay. I won't lie. Yeah, because, yeah, one of the expectations that we're starting this um, term is that we spent the, we spend a few minutes before each chapter discussing the the answers to the objectives. But if you haven't re reviewed the material, that's going to be kind of hard to do. So let's um, let's get with chapter eighteen. Okay, so I am in the book. Okay, and we're not going to go through the, every, the whole chapter. I've already been through this and I've already outlined um, important concepts that I need you to understand from each chapter. Okay, so I'm not sure we're going to be able to do this right now if nobody's reviewed the information. But um, so after going through this chapter, you can go back and look at the objectives and you should be able to explain, identify, describe, work with, you should be able to do all, you should be able to articulate this, okay? So we are talking about family development and family nursing assessment, okay? So in the hospitals or in your clinicals, you're probably used to doing individual assessments, is that correct? Well, in the community, we do not only individual assessments, we do family assessments. We may be, our client may be an entire family. Okay. So um, what, what, are, what is our role with family nursing in the community? Helping families. You can, and anybody that wants to follow along with me, I have a lot of students who pull up the book and they follow along with me and they highlight what I've highlighted. So it's up to you. But um, some of our responsibilities um, with regards to family nursing, remember we said last week in community nursing, your client could be an individual, your client could be a family, your client could be a subset of the population, say the homeless or the diabetics or the elderly, or your client could be the whole community, right? So what we like to do is help uh, families promote their health. We try and help uh, meeting the family health needs, coping with health problems within the, within the context of existing family structure and community resources, and then helping, collaborating, working with the families to help them find interventions, help them find resources, okay? So family demographics, what is it? Uh, what is the definition of a family? Right? There's real no definition right now of a family. It's whatever they say it is, right? So it refers, to, it refers to two or more individuals who depend on one another for emotional, physical, or financial support. And that can, we'll get to a box here that defines all kinds of families, okay? So there's five family functions, okay? So historically, families have performed a variety of functions or they're made up their makeup is of five different things. One is the economic function. One is the reproductive function, socialization, effective, and healthcare. Okay, so you can read through those, but this is on your study guide. Okay, historical family functions, which means that every family has an economic makeup. Every family has a reproductive makeup, social, effective okay so these are the most five common family functions or what makes up a family okay families and this is where we talk about the difference between functional families dysfunctional families healthy families not healthy families those are used interchangeable a family that performs um, all of these in a positive way is considered a healthy family for purposes of this chapter, okay? So let's take a economic function, for example. Family income is a, is a substantial part of the family economics, okay? So for example, 
let's say you have a family that can afford a house, can afford a car, can afford to save for retirement. Um, they make sound economic decisions. That's considered health, one of the healthy functions, right? But what about a family who is living in poverty? Both parents are unemployed. They have difficulty with food security, okay? That's considered a not a healthy family for their simple financial status, okay? So that's how I want you to look at the rest of them, okay? So we know that families have evolved over time. Okay, some have become more important and others less important. Okay, so within families, we look at the relationship function and we look at the health function. Right, so the relationship is how people get along. Okay, and then the health function is what is the physical and mental health of family members? And when we're talking about families, we refer to family structure. What is family structure? Okay, family structure is, the family structure is what are the roles of the family? Are you the mom? Are you the dad? Are you the kid? Are you the dog? Are you the aunt, the uncle, the grandparent? That's what's determined with family structure. So we have family function and we have family structure. So the structure is, how is that family structured? Who's who? Okay, what's the role of those people in the family? Does that make sense? Okay, so family function and family structure. We have to know the difference between those. And I'm only going through the parts that I've highlighted because I've already gone through this book several times. And so we're going to skip through lots of stuff. Okay, there's a, there's a few concepts we need to pull from each chapter. Okay. Here's some, Bhakti 18.2 is interesting. It's family structures. What might a married family look like? What might a single parent family look like? What might a multi-adult household look like? So just some examples. And here's a little bit more explanation of family health and non-health, okay? So health professionals, we tend to classify families in two groups, healthy families, non-healthy families. Same thing, functional, non-functional, okay? So when we talk about the, the health of the family, right, it really does more, it focuses more on the mental health of the family, not so much the physical health, okay? The other um, Synonym we can use is balanced families, unbalanced families, all that, they all mean the same thing. Okay, but the importance is to recognize what are the characteristics of a healthy family? And here they are in box 18.3, we need to know this. Okay, so when you're doing a family assessment, you need to be able to identify after your assessment, is this a healthy family? Is it a semi-healthy family? Is it a not, is it, a non-healthy family, okay? And the one thing that, what, when you read through these 12, what jumps out at you? Have a look at these and just tell me what you see. I think especially nowadays, number two, the family affirms and supports all of its members is really important. Yep. What is a common theme you see through these 12? The family as a whole, it's a unit. Bingo. Who said that? I did. I don't know who. I can only see three people. I can only see Kimmy, oh. which I can't Erica. see Kimmy. I see her window. I see Robin and I see Tiffany. That's all I oh. see. Oh, okay. Erica Thank you. Said that. That's exactly right. What this is... The, the, the common thread through this is the family is one unit. They're not splintered apart. 
Okay, they affirm each other, they respect each other, they all have a sense of trust. It's all. Okay, the family plays together. All members interact with each other. Families share leisure time together. Okay, so that's the common thing. So one of the most important things to remember with characteristics of the healthy family is it's all one unit. Okay, so let's say you have some people, some family members go to church on Sunday or some family members celebrate the holidays. For purposes of this chapter, that's considered unhealthy. All righty, make sense? Okay, in every, I, I know I explained this in my recording, in every chapter we're gonna, there's a few things in every chapter that I really need you to review. In every chapter, I need you to review the levels of prevention. Oh my gosh, excuse me. Can't hard be yawning, I'm sorry. Um, because levels of prevention in each chapter apply to the particular topic concept in the chapter we're talking about, okay? And so we have to be able to apply levels of prevention for each different chapter. And it, every chapter has a levels of prevention box geared towards that chapter. The other thing I want you to look at in every chapter is your Healthy People 2020 box. Okay, there are Healthy People 2020 questions on the exam. There are several levels of prevention questions on the exam, so we have to get that. Okay, so for example, let's see what it says. Uh, levels of prevention for this chapter. So primary, we've already talked about, the, this is actually a good box to study because it gives you several ideas, right? Educate parents about healthy nutritional choices. Provide counseling and weight management for overweight kids. Help mothers that need WIC, help them qualify. Screen, secondary, screen teens for obesity. Okay, tertiary, work with schools to improve the quality of food offered in school lunches. Okay, so you really have to understand this is, this is a levels of prevention box about family assessment. You need to understand the differences. Remember, primary is prevention, secondary is screening, and tertiary is treatment. Okay, so in the tertiary level, they already have to have the concern, the issue, the disease, the diagnosis, and you're helping them manage it, right? Secondary, we're trying to screen for who's at risk and try and, try and get a jump on it before, before the child gets obese. Is the child at risk for obesity? Okay. We got that through screening. Now, what are we going to do to kind of stop that in its tracks before the act before he actually he or she actually becomes obese? And then we're then simply trying to manage it in the tertiary level. Make sense? We talked about this um, a little bit ago. Um, different ways to look at the family in the community. Okay, family is a context or structure. What that simply means is we're looking at the individual first and the family second, right? So for example, an example is a nurse using family as a context, family as a structure might say, how is your diagnosis of, how is your diagnosis of type one diabetes affected your family? Okay, so an example, so next is family as a client where individuals become second and you focus on the family, right? So an example of that is tell me what's been going on with your own health and how you perceive each family member responding to your mother's recent diagnosis of liver cancer. So that's family focused. The whole family's the client. Mom, grandma's been, di or mom's been diagnosed with uh, liver cancer. How's the family coping with it? Okay, and then the last is, is, um, well, actually family is a system. How does the family interact with society? Okay. 
And then family is a component of society. Uh, what do they do with health, education, religion, right? So those are the four, four approaches to family nursing. Family is a, con is a structure, family is a client, family is a system, and family is a component of society, okay? Again, I'm skipping through and pulling out what applies to the objectives. How are, we gonna, how are we gonna be able to meet the objectives? Okay, so how do we work with families um, for healthy outcomes? Okay, and this is what, think of your ad pie. Okay, nurses need, we need to have excellent communication skills to help families prioritize the issues they're confronting. We have to help them identify their needs, develop a plan of action. Right, family members are experts in their own health. They know their own family history, their health status, and their concerns. So we have to rely on the family on that <clears throat> pre-assessment to find out what's going on. Okay, so that means going to do a visit. Okay, what I want to mention about doing a visit is the most important thing is planning for personal safety. Okay, so we need, you need to be familiar with box 18.5. Okay, our home visiting safety tips. And this is also on your study guide, right? Safety first. We need to know the neighborhood we're visiting. Can we do it alone or do we, do we need an escort? Is it a high risk community where we need additional planning? Okay. So home visiting safety tips, really important that you know this. Why, why, would, why would the nurse sit between the client and the, expert, and the exit? To be able to get out quickly if something happens, the client becomes aggressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so please know a box 18.5. Here is the student case study. That's the answer sheet I sent you. Um, you got the, did I, I sent you the case studies along with the PowerPoint, right? The instructor led case studies. Did I send you guys those? Along with this the PowerPoint. This week or last week? I, it would have been in, it would have been when I send the PowerPoints. I should have sent the case studies along with it. Should have gotten four PowerPoints and four case studies. This week there was one case study and last week there were four. Well, I think. Two. Two. I'll double check. I'll double check the announcements because there's two types of case studies. One is an instructor led case study, which I like to send to you because it has all the rationales. And it's really, really good. Okay, so I'll make sure you get that. I try and review them in class if we have time. But again, the instructor-led case studies are another resource to enforce your learning. Okay, this is one of the two activities I was telling you about that is additional in the book that you can do. Okay, and I've sent you, where does it say? This is where you, this, this, the case study in the book that comes up like this are the answers I sent you. It's just an additional reinforcement tool. So if you want to go through that, that's fine. You have the answers. You don't have to go to Elsevier to get the answers. Okay. Okay. How do we do it? How do we do a family nursing assessment? Right. Obviously, we have to do a nursing assessment to be able to develop nursing interventions. Right. So think about try and step out of the hospital clinical setting and think about we're dealing with a family now, not an individual patient. OK, so we have to be able to use the nursing process. Right. So we identify issues, we identify strengths, we identify what kinds of interventions what might be looking for, and we have to involve the family in this process. Okay. 
So a family nursing assessment is an ad pie. It's the beginning of your ad pie. We're just doing it with a family in the community setting. Okay. What the, one of the assessment models we want to talk about is the Friedman family assessment model. This is the most common assessment model. We're on page 305. Okay, and this one draws heavily on this structure versus function framework. Okay, it's a big overarching approach to family assessment, right? So they view families as a, as a subsystem of society. Okay. So the family structure, which is the organization of the family, how's the family made up, and the family's functions, which are activities, and the family's relationship to other social systems is the focus, okay? And what I'd like you to know about the Friedman model is <clears throat> they assess based on six broad categories, okay? And these are them, identifying data, develop, developmental, fam, developmental family stage in history, environmental data, family structure, and so on, okay? So those are the categories that the Friedman model uses. So be familiar with the Friedman model. And then we get to, I'll always stop at the levels of prevention in Healthy People 2020, okay? You can read through these, I'm just highlighting them. These are specific to families and family nursing. Don't worry about this at the beginning, <coughs> EMC, FP, MH, this is where to find those in Healthy People 2020. They're just categories. I just need you to know what they are, okay? For example, number one, increase the proportion of parents who use positive parenting and communicate with their healthcare providers about positive parenting. That's a Healthy People 2020 goal. Remember, on exams, when you get asked a Healthy People 2020, 20 question, let's say you got asked a healthy people 20, 20 question on family nursing. The, the correct answer is only, the correct answer is only in this box, okay? You may think of another 20 things that could be in here, but they're not, okay? So please, please, I cannot stress enough Healthy People 2020 questions only want to know what's in this box. They don't want to know what you also think is a good idea. If it's not, how, if it's, if it's not identified in their objectives in each chapter, pardon me, it's not a correct answer. Okay? So that's chapter 18. Do we have any questions about family assessment? Again, I covered... I covered topics and concepts that meet the objectives, that meet the study guide, that meet the PowerPoints, okay? Trying to keep everything really, really focused, okay? So when you go back to study for the exam, please study the highlighted parts of the chapter. Make sense? All right, let's keep going. Family health risks. There's a lot of family health risks, right? Because the family may include an infant, toddler, young kid, middle-aged kid, high school kid, college kid, adults. So we're talking family health risks, a lot of them, okay? And by the way, this chapter outline in each chapter this is exactly the way that the chapter is outlined. So this is just a, a quickie view of what's coming up in the chapter, okay? Again, you gotta look at your objectives because that's what I'm covering, okay? Okay, so historically, when we're looking at the health of the families, um, historically, we've focused on three major areas. The effect that an illness has on the families, the role of the family in the cause of the disease, and the role of the family in its use of services. Okay?
what's risk? What's the concept of risk? Just think about risk in everyday life. What's risk? More chances of happening or uh, potential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we're talking about health risks. The concept of health risk refers to factors that are predisposing or increasing the likelihood of ill health, right? That's really important in family health, right? So we need to always pay attention and we'll talk about these as the term goes on with environmental and behavioral factors that lead to ill health with or without influence of hereditary. I think of substance abuse when I read that. You know, you may not have a hereditary history of substance abuse, but I don't know the environmental and behavioral factors that take place in a family may cause that. Okay. There's only two objectives for Healthy People 2020, um, and it tells you what they're related to, family and health. Okay, I'm on page 312. So, Professor Marvel, I have a question. Uh-huh. So, the chapter that you are going through, I have like different chapters. So a chapter 18 for you is like chapter 20 for me. That is true. I had, it took me a while to figure and that out. Healthy people 2020 going through, I have healthy people 2030. So is that the same concept we're covering right now? Or? Oh, wow. So <clears throat> this book is based on healthy people 2020. We are introducing you to healthy people 2030 in this class. Okay, but this built is book on how is built on healthy people 2020. So I don't have 2020 in my book. The, the, the portion that you're reading, healthy people 2020, that highlighted in your book, my book is, is not healthy yeah. people 2030. The so, book we have access to on Vital Source, is that the one you're talking about, Tech? Yes. That's not the book that you're showing right now in class. Just hmm. so you know. So we're like, it's going to take time to go back and find which chapters match up. And I tried to access it two different ways. And one of the ways told me I didn't have permission to access it where you can get like the key points and all of those things broken down through all the Elsevier books. Hmm. It says we don't have access to that. So, and then when you, what book, do, what book, hang on one second. All right. Okay, let's go back. Here's your module. Where's the syllabus? We can't see your screen. Okay, I'll share it in one second. I'm just going back to the syllabus. So the acts like there's one fifth edition, and then there's a sixth edition. Okay. Um, so you guys don't have access to the sixth edition, right? Just the fifth? That's what Looks I'm like We have access to sixth because like, I, like what I'm seeing is I don't have healthy people 2020 in my book. I believe, I think, I hope that's the same concept we're covering. If not, then we're- Yeah, it is. We have six. We don't have the fifth. And you're teaching off of the fifth. Okay. And so here in your, let me share my screen. Because your 18 is program management, right, Tech? Yes, 18 is program management. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I just want to, what am I looking for? Oh, back to the module. So let me go and check in your student view. Right here. Here's your conversion guide. Did everybody see that? Yes or no? Do you guys see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's your conversion guide. Okay. Where is the 
the rest of it. See, it's the difference between the fifth edition and the sixth edition. Okay, so that, that's a conversion guide. So in the fifth edition, but I, oh, here it is. It goes all the way down. Okay. So am I the only one that has a huge problem with this? Because that yeah. document is 25 pages long. You're teaching off of, a, of a, an older copy of a book, mm -hmm. which is fine. But what we are given is a newer version of the book. Like, mm -hmm. the, the, I, ha, I have a huge problem with this. And I'm sorry if okay. I'm the only one, but this is not cool or okay. At least in PEDS, she tells you like, hey, you have this version. We have this version. All this, all of our stuff is based off what you have access to right now. And how are we supposed to follow along? Okay, just relax, please. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> just be respectful, okay? I'm just sorting this out as well. Who? I'm just curious. Who is talking? I can only see three people. Tiffany Work. Pardon me. Tiffany Work. Okay. Thanks, Tiffany. I appreciate your feedback. Um. So. Okay. I will bring this up to my course lead and find out how she would like me. So again, I'm, I'm going back to chapter what, 18? Just bear with me for one second, please. Okay. I see what you're saying. And I will bring that up to my course lead and ask her how she would like us to do that. Um, because that's what a conversion guide is. Um, so, so you guys have access to six and we're teaching from five. Okay. I think part of the concern is, mm -hmm. is the same, um, like objectives on healthy people, 2020, mm -hmm. the same as healthy people, 2030. Because if we're studying healthy people 2030, that's in our book, mm -hmm. and it's different than the healthy people 2020, which the test is or exam is based on, mm -hmm. then we're not studying the correct information. Okay. Agreed. Okay. I'm hearing all of what you're saying. This is Erica. My, own, my biggest concern is that, like, say I take the exam, I go to review an exam. I want to know exactly in the book what page, what paragraph, what set, like verbatim where I can find the answer for myself in the event I get a question wrong and vice versa. So it's kind of hard when you're going back between two different editions. It's still the same content, but when it comes to testing and exams, I want to be able to say, well, this is why I chose this answer, because on page 596, paragraph three, it says this. Mm -hmm. That's okay. it. Okay. So I'm going to continue on with at least teaching the, uh, I have to sort out this edition five and six. Um, did anybody notice that they had a conversion guide in their module? I didn't no, notice I that we had a that we had a conversion table, but I mean, I thought it said conversation guide. My <laughs> only um, issue is that I mean, we this we have three. I take three classes. I don't have time to sit and figure out what page is what and what I'm supposed to study and what I'm not supposed to study. And agreed, agreed. I mean, I don't have time for that. Okay, so I'm going to keep going. I hear you. I'm going to take this up with my course lead. Okay, but. Um, the highlighted portions in the book that I'm using, these aren't two separate books. These are, well, they are two separate books, but the topics are the same. They need to be, most topics are the same. They just are found in a different page on the, is everybody, does everybody have the sixth edition or does anybody have five? This was in last term too. I know that people in last term had the same, the book that was online was not the book that oh, they had hear, access to for a community i didn't hear that in yeah community. so like some people actually went out and bought an entire different textbook with their own money mm. just to be able to follow along yeah i didn't know that i was not aware of that issue um there was no conversion guide last term 
So, uh, oh, so you knew that, not you specifically, but like for next term, that way, would be nice to know for your next term. Go ahead, Stephen. Is there any way you can send us the uh, the PowerPoints you, you are using for this class? I send them to you every weekend. Oh, okay. You have week one and week two PowerPoints. Okay. I mean, yep. is it the same as what you, you use in the class? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I teach based on the PowerPoints. So I go through the PowerPoints and I pull out the information in each of the chapters that support the concepts in the PowerPoints. Does that answer your question? No. My question is like uh, those that you highlighted, the, the same PowerPoint that you highlighted with the yellow ink mm -hmm. and the green, is that the same uh, PowerPoint you posted uh, first week? That's her, week? that's her book, right? Oh, so okay, the that's your book. So the PowerPoints are a summary of each chapter. And then I go through the PowerPoints and pull out the concepts that we need to know and go to the book and highlight those sections. Oh, okay. 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 So I, I would encourage you guys to just hear me out in the lectures about the information and topics that we're talking about. And then you can go to, is everybody going from the sixth edition? Does anybody have the fifth edition? Anybody? Okay, but what's important to understand is the topics we're covering and not so focused on the page numbers. So if you have to go back to the book and, and research more, you don't have to go through 25 pages. You have to go through in chapter 18, what you didn't understand or what you want to read more about, okay? This isn't asking you to go in and, and Cross check, uh, cross check everything. It's going, I'm covering what I'd like for you to know. And what you don't understand, you can go back and say, okay, it was program planning. In edition four, it was, or five, it was 266, and six, it was 318. So I wouldn't get too bogged down on page numbers. It's more understanding what I'm teaching. And then if you're not understanding it, then you need to go back and use this conversion table. But again, well, I'll take, go ahead. The page number thing comes into effect where it's like the first week, because this is the first time I'm aware of that this, the conversion guide has been pointed out. And so like the first week of class, I'm reading the wrong material. So now I get to go back and make up the readings for the correct, time uh, yes looking at your powerpoints and stuff but as you said those are just reinforcement of the book content and that was what my week one lecture was as well yeah right but and I how think do we that know part? that the things that you're teaching haven't changed between edition five and six because I I mean I know that we're taught that you know like nursing is evidence-based practice and it's always changing so how do we know that it hasn't changed between the two editions? There's been, the concepts and the topics are the same in both editions. They're just found in different places and more was added into edition six. If we cover it, I think you guys are making this, you're just, I know you guys are busy. I know you guys are overwhelmed. But, but please just go with me on this, okay? I just wanna cover topics and concepts, okay? And what we're not understanding, I will help you find in edition six. Let me talk to my course lead and find out how she would like me to proceed because this is gonna happen with all the community classes this term, all 12 classes, sections, okay? Yeah, one last question. I'm sorry to waste this time because it's very important. But so 
in the exam concept, uh, do, do we supposed to be testing in healthy people 2020 or 2030? We're going to be testing in healthy people 2020. That's the problem. The book doesn't have, my book doesn't have 2020. And my book is only 2030. Okay. That, I think that's the point we were trying to make is there's okay. no 2020. Okay. I, I hear you guys. So I guess to just make it and summarize up, I'm sorry, this is Tiffany Swallow. So I just want to make sure. You're saying that 2020 is the same as 2030. They just changed the last two numbers. The content is the same. No, Everything no. is the same. And anything is different that you're going to cover or no? The R exams are based on 2020. So I, again, I need to talk to my course lead to see how she wants to handle this. Um, if your book, if your version is only 2030, then we need to figure something out. I get that. I can't, I can't solve this problem right here, right now. Okay. I'm hearing all your feedback. I'm going to take it to my course lead and we'll come up with a plan going forward because this isn't the only section that's affected. All 12 sections are affected. Okay. It's all I can say for right now. Okay. Sorry, I just I don't think any of us are trying to like all come at you at one time. We're no, all just okay. tired and we all want to do well. And since there's only three exams and no quizzes, I get it. You know, every point it. counts. So I totally get Thank it. Thank you. I totally get it. And I'll look into I'm gonna look into the after class tonight. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Okay, um, I need to get back and focus. Okay, health risk appraisals. Okay, do you guys know what a health risk appraisal is? What's a risk appraisal? Anybody? Is it like a form or a, or something that you like fill out to decide to, to figure out if you're like at high risk or mm, medium exactly. risk or low risk yep yep so a health risk appraisal refers to the pro you're assessing for the presence of risk factors okay so what is the likelihood that you're going to get cancer what is the likelihood that you're going to have a heart attack based on risk factors, family history, genetics, okay? What is health risk reduction, right? Health risk reduction is making the assumption that you are reducing your risks. As you reduce your risks, you will decrease the probability that something's gonna happen, right? That's risk reduction. Correct? Okay. And then what is a family in crisis? What does a family in crisis look like? Okay, a family crisis is defined as when a family is unable to cope with an event and becomes disorganized or dysfunctional. Okay, so the demands of the family situation exceed the resources of the family. Okay. And again, um, we're back to healthy people 2020. We've already covered that, but healthy people 2020 focuses on health promotion and health protection. Okay. It focuses on preventative service and surveillance and data systems. Okay. So again, you don't have access to healthy people 2020 in your sixth edition. So we're gonna to have to come up with a plan for that. Okay, there's, um, do you guys know what determinants of health are? Okay, so here's some, here's four important definitions related to family health. Okay, if you put 2020 and 2030 aside, the concepts that are covered in the fifth edition are the same concepts and topics covered in the sixth edition. Okay, with a difference of 2020 and 2030. So we need to know these, okay, these four 
four definitions. Okay, what determines health? That's what that means, determinants of health. What determines health? An individual's biological makeup through interactions with social and physical environments as well as behavior. Behaviors, you need to know the difference, uh, the definition of social environment, physical environment. How do we do a biological health assessment? Okay, a biological health assessment, that's where the genogram comes in. We're gonna learn about a genogram and an eco map. Okay, a genogram is done as a biological health assessment. So for example, does anybody know what a genogram is? Does anybody re remember from your PowerPoint, what's a genogram? Anybody? Isn't it like where you um, go through like your family history and see what um, mm -hmm. illnesses they have? Yep, yep, yep. So one of the most effective techniques for assessing patterns of health is through a genogram. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a. Uh, you go back three generations and do a family history. Who died from what? Is are you going to have a cardiac? A, a cardiac risk or substance abuse risk, okay, breast cancer risk. So you could go back and develop three generations worth of information so that you can identify what health risks are potential for you, your kids, your relatives, okay? It identifies patterns of illness, okay? So it looks like this, okay? So you start up on the top here and then you start to go down generations, okay? And figure out what was going on with everybody, okay? And these are usually done because some, genograms are, are, they're done with people for, that have died or have been diagnosed with something that's kind of unknown to their family. Does that make sense? Because if you already know your family history is full of cardiac, then you're already predisposed, right? If you know your family history it maybe is obesity, then you're gonna be already exposed to those health risks, okay? Okay, the next is a um, eco map. Okay, so an eco map, is the, in an eco map, what is the social structure of the family? So for example, it's an environmental risk assessment, just trying to get the circle right here. So this is, a, this is an eco map right here. So your family's in the center and what's their relationship with everything in the community? With each other, with, with family members, with sports, with recreation. So look at how busy, look at all these connections, social connections that this family has, okay? What happened during COVID to this circle? Do we have all these social connections? Nope, families were pretty much confined right here. Does that make sense? So an eco map is your social connection to your community. So we look at genograms, biological assessment. Um, eco maps are your environmental assessment. So those are two terms that you wanna know. Okay, it looks at social risk, your eco map. Relationship with society, social risks. Our families introverted, extroverted. What risks are associated with each one, okay? Here's another example of the identifying family factors that decrease the risk for substance abuse in children, okay? So 
we go back to the healthy families versus unhealthy families. So the li this literature suggests that the following family factors that decrease the risk for substance abuse in children, here's three of them, family closeness, families doing things together, families modeling good behavior. Okay. Um, nursing approaches to family health reduction. So home visits. In community health, we say that home visits are one of the most important tools you can have for doing your, doing your ad pie, doing your nursing process. Like you would go into a patient's room and do a full head to toe assessment. Well, the same applies in the community. You would go into a family's home and do a full, full head to toe assessment of the family. Right, you would look at safety risks, you would look at communication, you would look at behaviors, family interactions, the condition of the house, the condition of the people in the house. Okay, so home visits are the most, are the best way to get a detailed assessment. You can assess all the risks. Okay, and then what we need to know is table 19.2, which I'll would have to look at the conversion to see where 19.2 is in version six, but we need to know the phases and activities of a home visit. Okay, you have five phases, and I'd like for you to be able to identify, you know, if you were given a question and said, um, the nurse is doing a home visit, here's what she's gonna do. Which phase is that? Okay, is it in the initial, think of ADPI here, initiation phase, pre-visit phase, in-home, termination or post-visit. Okay. And I'm not gonna, I mean, I'm kind of going through this quickly because it doesn't sound like a lot of people prepared. And so, I'd like for you to do some work, some of work on your own as well with um, kind of doing your own research to meet these objectives, to be able to answer these objectives. And then the rest of the chapter goes through all these different phases. You don't need to read the rest of that if you understand this. Okay, so table 19.2, and then it goes on to summarize every, every phase, okay? And then contracting. Contracting is, what is contracting? Okay, it's an agreement that you have together. You're contracting with the family. So it has to involve two parties. You have to come up with a plan together. And that's the important part of contracting, that it's mutual, okay? And they have phases and activities of contracting. Again, table 9.3, we need to know this. If you're given a question that says, here's what's going on with contracting with a family, here's the stage we're at, which phase is this? Is it the, in the beginning, working, or termination phase? Again, think of ADPOT. Okay. Lots of terminology in here that is similar to ADPI. Your beginning phase is your assessment phase, right? Coming up with a plan, assessment, planning. Your working phase is your intervention. Your evaluation. You have to be able to take your ADPI concept and apply it to these different chapter topics, okay? And then here's levels of prevention related to families. So I want you to read that, page 328. Okay, if you don't understand that, please let me know. I think that was it for this chapter. 
So that's it for that chapter. So that's chapter 19, which is the family health risks. <clears throat> and then this one, family health risks across the lifespan, that's a topic right in your study guide. Okay, all these, all these chapter heads are, are broken up in your study guide. Okay. So let's talk about family risks across the lifespan. Okay. This chapter starts with, you know, what are major health problems of kids and adolescents? What, what's our nursing interventions to promote child and adolescent wellness? What about men and women? What are the risk factors with men and women? What are the risk factors for older adults? What are the risk factors of people in the community with special needs? Okay, so you should be able to answer these objectives. Okay, there's a nice little summary of how important children's health is as it relates to major public health issues, right? The health and well being of children has a significant impact on the future of the country, right? We need to make sure kids are getting immunized, getting regular dental care, regular medical care, primary care visits, right? Kids without insurance are at a much more disadvantaged state. Okay. So young kids, because physical, cognitive, behavioral changes are occurring so rapidly, it's even more important to be focusing on making sure these kids are healthy at early ages. Obesity is a huge problem, right? Obesity rates in American kids have risen to uh, epidemic levels in the last couple of decades. Big problem. I saw it in the schools for 20 years. It started out pretty low key, but you know, the last couple of years before I retired, did lots and lots of education with kids and families. Okay, box 20.1 is something we need to know. What are the family recommendations for obesity prevention? So if you're given a question about you know, I don't know, select all that apply or pick one, select all apply. What are some recommendations we would talk about with the family for obesity prevention? Okay, here's your, I know there's a lot of them, but if you read through them, just th they're common sense. These are things we should know as a nurse. Okay. You know, if a parent says, um, well, I'm going to, I, I feed my, I have my kid drink 100% fruit juices, right? For every meal. Is that good? No. So they're common sense things. No, what would, if a parent said, if a parent said, I, they drink fruit juice all day, that would be an opportunity for you to do some education. Does that make sense? So we need to know, we need to understand what the recommendations are because community nursing, most of it's teaching, right? So obesity, when we're dealing with kids across the kids across, you know, ages three through whatever, 21, we need to be able to identify what the risk factors are for these kids. Okay. And then injuries and accidents, right? This is for kids. Injuries and accidents are the most common cause of preventable diseases, disability and death among children. Unintentional injuries, what are they? Injuries sustained by accident, falls, fires, drowning, drowning, suffocation. Okay, but accidents and injuries are the most common cause of preventable health issues. And then the leading cause of unintentional injuries in kids in children are motor vehicle accidents, suffocation, drowning, poisoning, fire, and falls. 
And then there's a chart about all that. If you want more information, we don't need to know that chart, 20.3, but very interesting statistics. And so then it goes through the developmental considerations. So I'd like for you to read through this on your own. It goes through infants. What are their, what's their risk? Well, each section goes through what the biggest risks are. Okay. So please understand what the, the risks are for infants, for toddlers, for school age, adolescents. Okay, those are the, and this is in your study guide as well. Injury, all these, all these um, different categories, that's all in your study guide. Injury prevention. Okay, believe it or not, you need to know about playground safety. Let's say you're the community nurse and they're building a new park. They just got a grant and they're building a great big playground outside the rec center. Well, they come to the public health nurse, community nurse and say, hey, we're building a playground. Uh, we want you to work on this with us. Um, what are the guidelines for safety? What can we do and what can we not do? So you need to understand the guidelines for playground safety. Again, this should be familiar to you. Um, I mean, obviously playgrounds should be surrounded by a barrier to protect children from traffic. The one students get hung up on is this sand, gravel, wood chips, and wood, wood mulch are acceptable surfaces. Uh, surfaces. They limit the shock of falls versus concrete. Okay, so have a look at that. Gun violence, huge. Gun violence is another risk factor that for children and that children may be curious and pick up loaded guns. We hear, hear stories on the news all the time. Okay, we have to be able to do some education with the families. You know, encourage families to remove guns from their home. If they're unable to do this, educate the families. What do we educate them about? How they store firearms. Making sure if stored firearms are unlocked and unloaded. Or uncocked and unloaded, right? Store guns in separate locations. So one of the first things you're going to do um, when you go into a home and do a home visit, and we'll learn this later in the term, but I'll bring it up now, is the first question you ask is, do you have firearms? Uh, I, do you want to know that before you go into the house? If you're going into a, I don't know, say rough neighborhood to do maybe an unannounced visit? So you want to know if they have firearms. If they do, you need to find out where they're stored. You need to see where they're stored. Is it secure? Or are you just putting yourself in danger? Okay. And then with kids, we also, there's lots of talk about behavioral problems, right? ADHD, substance abuse, Elimination problems, conduct disorders, delinquency, and on and on we go. Autism, anxiety, depression, bipolar. Lots of issues going on with kids a result, as a result of behavior. Okay. And then what we know is um, because of improved, let's say, technology, uh, medication, treatment, diagnostics, people are living longer. What do we get with people living longer? A huge increase in chronic health problems. Huge. Okay. In fact, chronic health problems are, are the most significant diagnoses we take care of in our healthcare system chronic diseases. 
Okay, that we have to be careful of our kids that are, are very compromised. Okay, they have chronic health issues and they need routine care. Part of our assessment when we do with the family is are the parents able to meet the needs of the, their kids? Can they get them to doctor's appointments? Do they have issues with transportation? Do they have issues with money that they can't, uh, don't have a car, they, they don't, can't get transportation to appointments? I mean, that's a problem. It's part of your family assessment. Can they meet the needs of their, or their kids? A lot of kids that are very um, compromised may need physical therapy, occupational therapy, whatever, speech outside the home. Can they, or, or in the home, can the parents, are they capable of making multi, multiple appointments, keeping multiple appointments? That's something else that has to be, that risk has to be assessed. Okay, and then they talk about asthma being a chronic disease um, and how many kids have asthma now. Okay. What do we do for asthma? And then here, page 341, it discusses all the interventions we can do with kids with asthma. So again, I want you to read that section. Smoking, right? What do we do? What do you do if you go into a family assessment and it's, there's a house full of smoke? What do we do? We gotta work with those families to try and the long-term, the end goal is a smoke-free environment. What can we do to help those families? Smoking cessation programs, educational material, you know, educating the family, right? Parents should be offered, it's right here, educational programs dealing with the negative effects of smoking on children, especially kids with asthma. Interventions to stop smoking, I mean, you don't really think of these things when you're kind of in your clinical settings in the hospital, but remember you've stepped out to the community and are in people's homes and now you're making assessments about the environment they live in, okay? You're also assessing the immunization status, environmental health hazards. Do they live in a neighborhood that's near a railroad or an airport or is high pollution or possibly near water that potentially could be contaminated. I mean, the community risks are by the thousands. Just depends on how your community is, how does your community function? Okay, this we need to know. We need to know the five examples of federal legislation that have influenced the health of adults. Okay, this is in your study guide. Okay, we need to know the difference between the Older Americans Act. I'm just reading this. The Americans with Disability Act, ADA. The Patient Self-Determination Act. This is right in your study guide. You don't have to write this down. Family and Medical Leave Act and Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act. And in the study guide, there's a paragraph about these five and it gives you a one-liner of what each of them are. So if you're given a scenario, you have to be able to determine which federal legislation would apply. Okay. And then it goes through and gives you a little bit more explanation um, of what each of them are. But the study guide, I think, does a nice job of summarizing them. Okay. And then ethical and legal issues for older adults. I'm going to have you read this section on your own because this is where it starts to talk about elder abuse. Ethical and legal issues with regarding taking care of older adults. Okay. The most important thing to know is is the client able to take care of themselves? That's what the Patient Self-Determination Act is all about. Okay, are they able to take care of themselves? If they are, then we want them to participate in their care, right? The most common involves decision-making, right? We have to do an assessment of, is our client able to make decisions? If they're not, what do we need to do? 
Are they able to care for themselves? If they're not, what do we need to do? If they're at end of life stage, can they make their own decisions about pain management? And then they talk about here of elder abuse, physical, psychological, financial, social. Okay, those are all violations of the individual rights of the client. The willful, willful infliction of pain, debilitating mental anguish, theft or money mismanagement. What if you have, what if a, a, a couple is, they're moving in with their kids and they're fine. They've taken care of their finances forever and ever and ever and ever. And they're still okay to do so. But certain circumstances have required them to now move in with their kids. Well, what if the son wants to take over all the finances, even though his parents are capable of doing it? Is that a problem? That's a yes or no question. And why is it a problem? It is a problem. Why is it a problem? Because before they moved in, they were very self-sufficient. And now all of a sudden somebody else wants to take over their finances. That's a red flag for potential financial abuse. I mean, how many times do we see those awful stories about the elderly getting taken advantage of? Right? And again, the last part of this chapter covers chronic illnesses. So I want you to go through and read about major health issues and chronic disease management of, of adults across the lifespan. So it goes through chronic illness. Here's your Healthy People 2020 box. Uh, in this book, it's page 345 and the objectives are um, relevant to major health issues and chronic disease of adults. Healthy People 2020 is also um, represented um, very nicely in your study guide. Okay. And then you'll have to go through the rest of this chapter um, to what are, what are risks across women, men. There's a few more categories. Here's your levels of prevention. Okay. So this is kind of a big chapter. And, and Women's health concerns, okay? You'll need to read through that. Reproductive health concerns, gestational diabetes. So these are all, what, what you know, you may get asked, what are the major, what are the most common women's health concerns? Well, it's highlighted for you here. Eating disorders, reproductive health, gestational diabetes, menopause, breast cancer, osteoporosis, you just need to rattle off if you were to get a question, what are common women's health problems? There's six of them, seven of them. And then men's, what are men's health concerns? Remember we're going, this chapter is going across the lifespan. Health concerns across the lifespan, health risks across the lifespan. Well, there's a lot to go through in the lifespan. All the way from infants to the elderly, okay? And then health disparities. I want you to read through this section. <clears throat> disparities, what's a disparity? Disparity is not equal justice, right? One is receiving more than the other, okay? They bring up adults of color, correctional, incarcerated adults, LGBT, mental disabilities. All these headers are, are under the, under the section of who's most at risk, what groups are most at risk. That's what a disparity is, <clears throat> okay? Frail elderly, okay? So that's all I'm gonna cover in this chapter. We're good with that. I wanna just briefly go through, has anybody reviewed chapter 31 yet? <clears throat> that's the school nursing. 
Anybody taking a look at it yet? The study guide gives you a good section on school nursing and what we need to know. <clears throat> so I'm gonna just go through this quickly. So I wanna do our attestation. Okay, what's school nursing? Anybody know anything about school nursing? Community nursing. Hmm? It's one of the hats that a community nurse wears. <clears throat> I wore it for 20 years, loved it. Love school nursing. Okay. Okay, we need to know this, table 31.1. .1. What is the federal legislation that affects school nursing? Okay, we should know what these are. Section 504. This is also in your study guide. What's the section 504? What's the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act? What's the Americans with Disabilities Act? Again, if you're given a scenario, what's the WIC program? What's the No Child Left Behind program? You're given a scenario, you, you'll you be asked, which, which piece of legislation would this fall under? So if your question was, children cannot be excluded from schools because of their handicap. School must provide the health services that each child needs. Let's say that was your question. Well, which federal legislation affects that? Or, or does that cover? Be section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Okay. So we need to know those. Everybody has their scope of practice, school nurses, hospice nurses, home health nurses, occupational health nurses. Well, school nurses, our scope of practice um, is driven by the National Association of School Nurses, NASN. Excellent. If, you want, if anybody's interested in school nursing or wants to know more about it, go to the NASN website. It's phenomenal if you want to know about what school nursing is. But don't confuse yourself and go to that website to study for the exam. Okay, let's keep it focused. Okay. And then roles and functions of school nurses. Okay, 40 years ago when I started nursing, nurses in the schools gave hugs, band-aids, right? And wiped tears. Now, when I left a year ago, we do trach care, we do suctioning, we do insulin injections, we do G-tube feedings. We do central line, give medications, give shots, give whatever, right? Because we want these kids in school. So the scope of school nursing has blossomed to everything. Okay, we, we care for kids in the school setting, irregardless of what they have going on, cathing. G2 feedings, just we do everything, okay? So what can our roles be as a school nurse? Well, we can be a direct caregiver, okay? We can be an educator, lots of education. Teachers wanna know about all their students and all the health issues going on and we're the ones who educate them. We can be a case manager, case manager, we'll learn about that later in the term, but case manager is simply the organizer the organizer of healthcare. Well, the school nurse is usually the organizer of everything health going on in the school. She works with the teachers. She works with the, to educate them on the health risks they have in their classroom. She works with the PE teacher to talk about kids with disabilities. She works with administration to keep them involved in what they need to know about what kind of kids they have in the school that are compromised. Okay, that school nurse pulls all that together. Counselor. Do, we do community outreach. What, what you know, vaccination, vaccination clinics, flu shot clinics, what resources are out in the community for parents that need insurance, that need food, that need clothes, that are homeless. And we can also do our research if we want to do that. Okay. School nursing is really cool. 
Really cool. Healthy People 2020, objectives related to school nursing. This is on your study guide. Okay. We need to know these. Okay. If you're asked a question, what are the objectives of Healthy People 2020? The only correct answers are in this box right here. That is it. Nothing else. I can't stress that enough about healthy people questions. It has to be healthy people. Okay. Reduce the number of school days or work days missed among persons with current with asthma. That's what we did all the time. Our goal was to reduce absenteeism as much as we could. We wanted to keep the kids in school, worked with parents of kids with asthma, newly diagnosed, getting them into doctors, getting them inhalers in school. The goal is getting them, keeping them in school. Okay, this is a nice chapter if you want. And I know it's a school nurse chapter, but starting on page 546, where it says levels of prevention in schools, this is an excellent read about a much more detailed description of primary, secondary, and tertiary. Okay, I know it applies to the schools, but you can apply it to everything. Okay, this gives it a nice, gives a nice summary, gives you some examples in this visual in figure 31.2. Again, I know it's related to school nursing, but this is the most detailed these, uh, the, every other chapter has boxes, has a couple of lines about each. This has a whole section on primary, secondary, and tertiary. And then it goes through and, and talks about it in detail. Okay, so primary talks about it in great detail. What kinds of things are in primary? Then it goes into secondary. So please, if you're having a hard time understanding primary, secondary, and tertiary, have a look at this section. Okay. And then school nurses do the assessing and the screening, scoliosis screening, height and weight, vision and hearing. Okay, they're very involved in secondary. I would say it was probably evenly split, but we do a lot of primary with education, um, with at-risk kids. We do a lot of screening trying to identify these early problems, maybe with obesity or um, diabetes, nutrition, exercise. And then obviously we're screening for lice, screening for bed bugs, identifying abuse and neglect. This is all screening. This is still in secondary. That's why I say this is a really good, really good section on primary, secondary, and tertiary. Violence at school, and then finally we get into tertiary where we're using our nursing process. They already have asthma, they already have allergies, they already have seizures. So now we're trying to help them manage it, All right? Reduce complications, reduce the progression. Okay, so excellent. This is the best chapter you have for thoroughly explaining primary, secondary, and tertiary, okay? Then it goes to the different kids who are autistic, kids with diabetes. You know, it's just, I've just highlighted the topic. You know, what kinds of things might, what kinds of conditions might kids have in school? Asthma, allergies, seizures, autism, ADHD. You guys know that. All right. So that's what I got. Okay, so that's a quick review. Uh, but again, take a look at your study guide. Take a look at your study guide. Okay. And see what, see what the school nurse section looks like. Read through that section of the study guide. What do you understand? What do you don't understand? Okay. Read through the sections of health risks across the lifespan. What do you, you're going to hear a lot. You're going to read a lot of what I've been saying tonight. Okay. So. So hang tight on the book issue, but really get going with the study guide, okay? That's primarily, it's a study guide. 
So primarily focus on that and start there. What do you understand and what do you don't understand? What you understand is crystal clear to you, great. But as you go through the study guide and say, oh, she kind of went through that fast. I need to go back and read that. Okay. All right, let's pull up our attestation. And it was, what is primary, secondary, tertiary, and give an example of each. So who wants to go? Primary was for the prevention. What's an example of pro what's an example of primary prevention? Um, counseling or like counseling for weight management. Sure. Yep. Yep. You try to be proactive, prevent anything from happening. Okay, so you guys can type that in there. If you want, if you want to do your assessment right now, if you want to do your attestation now, if you don't, then it needs to be done within 24 hours. Yes, Stephen. Uh, tertiary um, teaching um, diabetic patient to um, perfect do check. Perfect. So that's your example, but what's tertiary? Oh, that is the um, like testing treatment. Treatment, test, no, not testing, treatment, management, mm -hmm. yeah. So Stephen just gave us our tertiary, right? Tertiary's treatment. And he gave an example of teaching a diet. What did you say, Stephen? Teaching a diabetic. Uh, patients uh, how to do the acute check and then yeah. insulin injection. That's perfect. Great, thanks, Stephen. Who wants to tackle secondary? Secondary is like screening to identify diseases. Okay, so give us an example, Kimmy, of what we would screen for. Like mammograms or... Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Screening for, yeah, mammograms. Screening kids for... Height and weight, screening kids for vision and hearing to identify any potential concerns. That's why we screen kids for, that's why we screen all kids for vision and hearing, trying to identify early identification, early intervention. Okay. So when you're done with that, just hit submit and then you don't have to worry about that. Okay, that's it for me. I'll stay on for anybody who has questions. I'm going to stop the recording.